uh, preemption timer included. Debug exceptions, deterministic, CR, reads and writes, deterministic, read MSR, deterministic. So everything here, that can potentially be triggered by a, yeah, so this is now going to be everything that can be random will go into here. Okay, VM exits EPT violation. Then we will try to translate it. And if we can translate it, then we're good. So this is the code here. Um, three or nine. Okay, everything else. Break VM exit. So these are all EPT violation can handle depending on the state of paging, whether things have been initialized or not. 432 doesn't need unsafe apparently. Um, okay. Exceptions, deterministic. CR reads and writes, deterministic. Read MSRs, deterministic. EPT violations happen depending on the initial state of the VM when we're paging things in for the first run. Preemption timer, random based on the preemption timer. External interrupt, random based on that. So what we're gonna say is handle random events here such that the determinism can be maintained during uh, random events. And then this is like break out and handle the real ones. Okay, so this is it. So now we're gonna see, this is now going to run them in comparison. Please, please, I think it was an external interrupt. I don't know what else would cause a random divergence after that long. Um, continue, continue, break VM exit. What's, is this break not working as I expect it to? Should be. I don't know if I changed something else. Am I relying on all these things? Wow, I can't break like that from a match? Okay, and then they do differ. It's not a, it's not a tick. I'm breaking, I'm returning from a loop. I don't know why I couldn't do a break here. I don't know why that was different. Shit. Yeah, I just put the break view makes it here, but who knows? I would suspect this is due to VM exit differences. I'm probably getting a breakpoint that's then clearing single step. I don't think they're actually doing different things. I just, I find that unlikely. If it works the exact same every single time, I highly doubt. I think it's just one of these events is firing That's the only thing I could think of, but we can add this print back in. 
we can add our diff. Where was that at? 487. If he has 20 tools for office. <laughs> what are you working on? Um if old trace not equal to trace. Alright, now we'll see what differs. I love the GeoCity sand timer on Sandfile. Oh, yeah. Dude, Sandfile is fucking awesome. Oh, are we not going to get differences now? Oh. Oh, now that we're trying to observe the bug? <sighs> Fuckers. Reset it. I'm still getting interrupts and stuff. Hey, there we go. Now we get to see what the difference is. Name that difference. I think it's just an interrupt causing it to be like causing the the single step flag to slightly change, which then changes the boundary that I get a single step on, which then changes the instruction that I see. So I think they'll just get desynced by like one instruction or something, but I don't think this is actually a big deal. I think it's actually the other way. What's probably happening here is um, somehow that single step flag is getting cleared on one of them, old or new, I don't know. And that's causing one of them to like, maybe one gets an exception or an interrupt, an external interrupt, which then clears the, the single step flag or maybe sets the resume flag so we miss a single step. And then I don't actually set that single step flag again. So I think there's going to be a gigantic leap here when we get to the end. We're executing a lot of code, by the way. What is this? Just dump that here. You, this. I don't know. <laughs> that gets paged in. No idea what it's doing. <laughs> this is probably, this might be printing millions of instructions for all I know. I think they're the fucking same. I think I just get an external interrupt. All right, let's try this. Let's go back to this. Put the assert in. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're the fucking same. All right. Snapshot app. Blah, blah, blah. Trace difference. All right. Let's set the interruptibility state. Um... Um, interrupt. Interruptibility state. Permits certain events to be blocked for a certain period of time. This field contains the information about such blocking. Oh, guess non-register state. Active, halt, wait for sippy. Blocking by STI. Execution of STI with RFLEGS IF0 blocks masterful interrupts. Setting this bit indicates that this blocking is in effect. Oh, so that'll tell me, I see. 
So it will tell me the state. There's got to be a way that I can disable interrupts in the guest. Um, otherwise, they're delivered normally through the guest IDT. If this control is 1, the value of R flags IF does not affect interrupt blocking. I'm guessing that's the guest. Um... Cause I disable interrupts, don't I? Yeah, I disable interrupts at my level. Well, let's do this. Print x int. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we didn't see an external interrupt there. And I don't think I should ever see this. Oh, so it does happen. So yeah, I want to I want to disable interrupts. If this is one, the value of IF does not affect interrupt blocking. So like a shadow interrupt flag that I can use. There's got to be a way that I can block the VM, the guest from enabling interrupts. EPT. Guess interrupt status. Um, guest foos, link pointer. Guest, guest interruptibility states. An activity state. Are those read-only fields? No, we can set those. Uh, here's shadows. So can I set the interruptibility state? Can I literally set it and say, can't interrupt? Guess non-register state. Blocking by STI. Execution of STI with IF is zero, blocks maskable interrupts on the instruction boundary following its execution. Setting this bit indicates that the blocking is in effect. Blocking by move FSS and blocking by SMI, blocking by NMI. So how do I... How do I basically disable interrupts? If this is set, external interrupts cause VM exits. Otherwise, they are delivering normally through the guest IDT. So obviously, I need that to be set. If the control is 1, the value of R flags IF 
does not affect interrupt blocking, but I want it to, but is that the guests? Interrupt window exiting, that's not related. Um, exits do do. If such a VM exit occurs and this control is one, the logical processor acknowledges the interrupt controller acquiring the interrupts vector, and the vector is stored in the VM exit information field, which is marked valid. If it's zero, the interrupt is not acknowledged and the interruption field is marked invalid. Okay. But I guess, let's see, if we can, if we have a panic on external interrupt and we see a divergence without external interrupt getting hit. Okay, so we know that it's not external interrupt related. Okay, so then preemption timer. Shouldn't be preemption timers. So what else could potentially change in there? Okay, it's not preemption. Um, Okay. Um, EPT. Go to here, and here we'll just unconditionally restore everything. Ooh. Ooh. Uh oh. Let's try it again. We'll reboot. This would mean access. Oh, okay. Then it's not related to that. I feel like it's probably just like single stepping being different. All right, let's print where they differed. Um. Assert those. Oh, it's not equal. If it's not equal, then go through all these. And then if it's not equal to the new, then print how they differ. Oh, and here we'll just say uh, if bad is sum. If bad is sum, then we know that something didn't match. And this will print only starting with the one that didn't match. It'll print the All right, reboot it. Just got to get it in the right state. Unless I've got kernel memory corruption where I'm like reusing a page or something and a page is going up for reuse and we're clobbering something. Which would be a pretty big issue. There we go. Yeah, these are like completely off. I think we're just losing, at some point we're losing the interrupt flag. Uh, the step flag. Unless these are branch targets. These could be branch targets. 
These could totally be branch targets. Let me see where these go. 671. 742. Um, so 742 is returning. 671 is... I, I think that's what's happening. I think we're just losing that single step flag somehow. And I, I don't know how. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure how, but some somehow we're losing that single single step flag, I think. And then the single step's just off. But I would suspect I would suspect that one of these is just behind the other. Uh, the old one is at 742, and this is at 67. Okay, so we should see 27F at some point. Maybe not. Maybe we need to print more. CA. -A 2DF. 259. Uh, that's locking some shit. All right, let's add more prints. We'll go bad 1,000. I don't know. Th this would be my guess. Is I I don't I don't think this is actual non-determinism. I really don't. It's just so unlikely that every single one is exactly the same until some point in the future. That would basically mean that there's memory corruption in my OS that causes something to change that shouldn't. Or there's some CPU register state that my OS doesn't touch for a long time. Okay, a thousand is apparently a lot. That might have been too much. Oh, no, we're good. Same location. Okay, well that's actually an interesting sign then. So one's going to return, and where was this? Disassemble backwards from here. Jump not equal to 27F. <gasps> We're not taking this branch. Oh, it's TSC! It's a timestamp counter! Oh! Okay, this is not a big deal. It's, yeah, it's non-determinism, but it's not a big deal. We don't care about this. But yes, if we wanted this to be fully deterministic, we would want to hook the TSC. So yes, it is using the TSC, and it's slightly different. This probably is determining if it tries again or something. Um... Yeah, so we'd need some way that we can, um, we'd need some way that we can, yeah, what's a good way to increment RDTSC? It's actually a hard problem. I kind of need to know the TSC in the guest, otherwise time might jump backwards for some things. Quite frankly, we're like teleporting through time, but not a big deal. I don't think this will actually uh, affect the execution at all. So, cool. Cool. Okay, then we can turn off single stepping, and then we can see what our perf is. Um, we'll get rid of this print. We'll just print the PC. We'll print the PC of the exit, upon exit. They should always be the same. 
It's always the same. No differences. In theory, RDTSE could affect this. Um, yeah, I think that's working. Which then means we can do this. And now we can see the perf. 720 a second, single core. Um, oh yeah, now let's add the sampling so we can see coverage. Yeah, because right now coverage is zero. So we'll set coverage, I don't know, FFF, one in 4K, we'll randomly uh, try coverage. We can do almost free coverage now with uh, um, EPT. Okay, that fucked off. Come on. Why is that getting stuck? Oh, because I don't rearm the preemption timer, and then we get stuck in the VM. Yes. All right, so that determinism stuff doesn't matter too much. Because we now understand what's going on. Move this back. Get rid of this. Put this back to how it was. Okay, now we'll rearm the timer. Okay, and we don't have to worry about that VM disappearing because we always guarantee that we exit at some stage. All right, 700 a second. That's pretty good. I don't know how many instructions we're running, but it's probably a decent amount. Okay, here we go, reset. This is now on all cores. There we go, 1,600 a second. Ooh, that's not very good. Why is that perf so bad? I must be bottlenecking on memory, memory bandwidth. Well, then there's nothing I can do there, if that's the case. If I'm bottlenecking on memory bandwidth, I, I can't do anything about that. If they're truly dirtying that much memory, then these are just, yeah, probably, probably a bunch of sparse accesses. Why are you bottlenecking on memory? I mean, I don't know if I am for sure, but I, I think I am. I think it's very unlikely that it's anything else. It's just resetting the, the VM state is expensive here. Um, uh, could a while of hypothesis dirty this OU sixty four. Dirtied plus equals 4096. Panic. Dirtied. Uh, if dirtied. Greater than zero to ignore the first case. Dirtied this many pages. Uh, this many bytes. So we can figure out what a reset bandwidth is. I don't know. Maybe we're not hitting that. Maybe we're not. Maybe I do a lock somewhere stupidly. Unlikely, but possible. This will panic. Uh, 732. Yeah. So we've got this many bytes per fuzz case that we're resetting. If we divide this down to get megs per... Uh, this is megabytes. And then if we multiply that by... And the number of fuzz cases we were getting, what was it, 1,600 or something? 1,600? 1.2 gigs a second? I guess we're not bottlenecking on that. Um, the fuck are we bottlenecking on, then? I 
Maybe I've got some lock that I'm using. I don't think so. Stats lock. Host page table lock. Um, that shouldn't matter. Stats report. Nope. Oh, they're probably bottlenecking on VM exits. Because I think they're I think they're VM exiting a lot. And I guess the VM exits aren't scaling. I don't know why this wouldn't scale though. Like what here would not scale? What would not scale here? What would not scale? Is it VM exits or something? I don't... I think I am getting a lot of VM exits, but... I don't have any debug shit in here, do I? Maybe they're thrashing each other's TLBs? Hmm. <sighs> Are they bottlenecking on coverage reporting? I'm just going to return here. Turn that the coverage was new. Checking their inputs in the hash table. I'll just never report coverage as new. And then where's that panic? Okay, it's not that. See if it's the preemption timer. If I set that to a much higher value, see if I got my perf. Nope. The, it's weird that it kind of like randomly drops. What would be processor wide? Am I writing CR3 or anything stupid? Setting up those VMs shouldn't matter. Single stepping shouldn't really matter. We're not using a timeout. Injection is free. All right, I guess it's time to start adding some perf counters, I guess, that tell me where I'm spending my CPU time. Get the kernel GS base. Filter report coverage. Okay, I'll just entirely turn this off. Oh, is it that? Is it the coverage reporting? Preemption timer. We'll move this down. Same logic here. Continue VM loop. Is it just querying that um, coverage table? I don't think so.
Nope. Okay, good. So I know it's not coverage reporting, which is good, because if it were that, then my data structure would be broken. All right, so we got to get s statistics. Um, reset cycles. Number of cycles spent resetting the VM. Uh, VM cycles. Number of cycles spent inside the VM. And then... Um, VM exit cycles. Number of cycles spent handling the VM exits. Ah, uh, that's going to be hard to get right now. We'll just do reset and VM cycles for now. Sync into... Um, reset cycles, VM cycles. Reset cycles, VM cycles. Okay, so those will get synced up into the global stats. And then, fuck it, I'll just print the master stats here. Uh, debug. Should have debug on that. And I'll pretty print that. And then I'll set our sync interval lower. Set it to every second just so we don't have as much spew, because we're gonna have eight workers reporting that status. And then we just need to record these stats. Reset and VM cycles. So this is um, let IT equals RDTSC. Self.stats.VM uh, reset cycles plus equals CPU RDTSC minus IT. So this whole first part starts a timer. This whole part's gonna be recorded, so I'll know the cycles that we spend there. Yep. Lots of cycles being spent on resets. Maybe it's that B tree search. Okay, and then we'll do VM cycles. It's just this whole thing. What IT is CPU RDTSC. This is VM cycles. Yeah, we're spending almost all our time inside the VM. Right? So, VM cycles divided by this. It's 28 times larger. We spent 28 times more time in the VM. So, but why would that not scale linearly with cores? All right. Um, this is going to be time spent inside VM run only. Tighten that loop a bit. We'll see if it's still a 28x. If it is, if it's not, then we got to track some stats somewhere else. But it looks like it is. VM cycles divided by reset cycles. Yeah, it's still 28. Okay. Run.
maybe this init stuff is killing me. Resetting all these. I guess and it is false. Instead of doing that, what I can do is on an init, it's only these things. These are all hard coded. The host state doesn't change. So we'll avoid some of this stuff. And so now we're now we're trying to like minimize what we're doing. We always call reset. Um, unsafe. And then here in init, we'll just call reset here. Self dot reset just to make sure. Um, whoops. Self dot resets. Um, reset guest state to a known good state. All right, so now this is truly one time initialization that we do. So once we look up all this stuff, we program all these things, because maybe some of these are really expensive. Oh, we have a lock. Oh, that's a core local lock. So that shouldn't matter. I don't know, is there anything else in here that I was doing every case that was maybe bad? GDT stuff? Yeah, that's core local. Wait, that's global, isn't it? That's global. Um, I think I access it through core locals, but it's global. Um, interrupts. That'll get access to self interrupts. Yeah, it's local. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what we get. Nope, that's not that's not the bottleneck. One time and hit. Set the preemption timer. Program these things. Oh, uh, do I need to use VMID? Am I invalidating the page tables of all the other cores? Every VM and every VM exit. I think every VM exit on every core is invalidating all the TLBs for all of the VMs because the VM ID is global. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. I think every VM exit and uh, entry, so if another core is like doing a lot of stuff, all of the cores are getting affected because all of them are getting invalidated. Um, I think that's what's happening. So they're all fighting each other over invalidations. We're reaching VPIDs. Um, if it's in this and enable VPID is one, current VPID is the value of the VM execution control field in this. And she ensures that this is never zero. Okay. On, enable VPID. Okay. This is gonna fail. This should not even allow us to enter the VMs. Correct. Uh, we got a debug break, but this is on the, um, we cannot have a VPID of zero. But the way this works is,
by which a logical processor may cache information from multiple linear address spaces. When vputs are used, VMX transitions may retain cache information and the logical processor switches to a different linear address space. Um, oh, that's logical processor, though. Um, required VMX transitions to flush the TLBs and paging structure caches. This ensured that the cached old linear address space would not be used for that. It allows a facility by which a logical process... Okay, so this is probably really fucking important. So we'll, we'll set this. Um, I guess I want a unique identifier for my VPID. VPID is literally at zero. Okay. VPID is zero. Uh, virtual processor identifier okay then um, we'll set that vpid in the init once vm write vmcs here um set the vpid for the guest and core id plus one non-zero number <laughs> as u64 so now all the cores will have different vpids now we might have we're having general protection faults and yes, I think that's because we need to... Yep. Yep. We're having issues. And that makes sense because the we need to invalidate now based on the VPID. Um, current VPID is this. Entry uh, ensures it's never zero. EPT... Move to CR3, loads that. Depends if PAE is used. Okay, caching. VPIDs. Access and dirtied. To determine whether it supports this feature. Okay. And now... Um... I think I need to do in... Invul VMID, but I'm I am glad that this is failing because um, I thought this would maybe be a Heisen bug, but hopefully this will be a relatively obvious uh, issue. So caching translation information, VPN EPT augment this caching behavior. EPT, EPT defines the guest physical address space that defines that from a linear and to that both features blah blah blah. Translations can be cached, and paging structures can be cached. So I think the dirty bits are getting cached, and then we're not actually resetting the VMs. Um, and that's why we're like getting these very weird behaviors, right? Um, so here are the things. Linear mappings can get cached. Combined mappings. Mapping from a linear directly to a physical all the way across. Um, 
when it's not in use? Well, EPT is in use. When EPT is in use, guess physical mappings can be created. Combined mappings can be created. Um, directly or indirectly by the current EP4TA. They're associated with the current VPID, the current PSID, and the current EP4TA. And I honestly, oh, it refers to these 40 bits of the EPT PML4 table. Okay, so that's the root level table. So they're associated with the VPID, the PSID, and the current page table. Um, the linear mappings, okay. If EPT is in use, it may use them, blah, 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 and validating. Um, and one of these things mentioned dirty, didn't it? Um, guidelines for use of this. Software should use the invil EPT with the single context invil EPT type after making any of the following changes to an EPT structure. Um, changing any of the privilege bits from one to zero, changing the physical address, clearing the access flag, aha. So we have to invil EPT. I'm pretty sure this is what it is. We, we kind of theorized this a long time ago. Um, should use this before a VM entry with an EPTP if it has, um, OK. Basically, if we change those dirty flags, we should invil EPT on a specific target on a single target. Um, all context immediately after execution of the VMX on or immediately prior to the VMX off prevents pre um, immediately after execution of that. So I guess we should do that. So we want to use invil EPT. We give it a RM128. The register is the type, right? Yeah, the register is the type. If it's one, it'll invalidate all mappings associated with the EPT pointer specified in the invul EPT. If it's two, it invalidates mappings associated with all EPTPs. Okay, so I think we want to do an invul EPT. Um, and yeah, let's try it. So this is <coughs> uh, invalidates EPT. Um, and this is a type and a register. So in zero, this is going to be 1U64. Oops, we actually want this VM, right? This is closer to what we're going to do. Um, in this case, we will have the EPT pointer U64. So we will, eh, hey, U128. Why not? Because it's the bottom bits, isn't it? EPTP, yeah, bottom bits. So we'll just zero extend that, and then we can use a ref to that. Um, so this inv EPT invalidates the first argument, zero, is the register, and that's going to specify the type. So this is a specifically, this will invalidate a specific EPT. Um, it may invalidate other mappings as well. That's fine. So then this is going to be a reference to the EPTP. This is a memory clobber because we want memory to be flushed, but that's it. And that should be valid. And then invalidate EPT global with all. And I'm guessing in that case, it doesn't need an EPT. Does that need to be a valid pointer? 
Um, EPT is the register operand. Uh, VM fail. Otherwise, get the type. If it's a one, then I think global invalidation, the pointer doesn't matter. So we'll see if we can do a uh, core pointer null mute. Uh, just null. So invalidate EPT global. That will do a 2U64 type. So if I do a 1U64 type, oh, and is that a physical address? No, that will be a virtual address to it. So I just want to see if this will crash. Um, oh, and we'll just do OU64. And then we'll put brackets around these. Um, okay, so we'll do invalidate EPT global, and this is VM the mixon. When we do a VM exon, it says, right, immediately after. I uh, can use this immediately after this or immediately prior to that. Either pre prevents potentially undesired retention. Okay, we'll just do this. So that should, this should fail because we fucked up intentionally. We made this use a type one. So this should fail, page fault. Correct. But two, I don't think this will page fault because I don't think it actually uses that memory address. It's not in a happy state. Let's, uh, we'll have to hard reboot this. Okay, reset. But the global, I'm guessing, due to the pseudocode, it doesn't look like they actually read that operand. Oh, they do always get the EPTP from that. I see. Okay, so they always read it. Um, let me dummy is equal to. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Now you're using the CLI. Yeah, yeah. The web interface is just ass. Resets. I want to reset the VMCS state after all this shit. <coughs> um, uh, this also invalidates the TLB entries. Uh, since we have now changed uh, the paging structures with EPT above. Okay, so this should fail. Good. And now, validate EPT. We have an EPTP pointer. Okay, so then we just want to use invalidate EPT in reset at the end. And we'll pass it self EPT table as U128.0 because it's a fizz adder. And validate the EPT. Holy shit. Is this it? Fuck. Fuck. Okay, we'll do the invalidate all. Invalidating all fixes it. <laughs> Safe? Safe to say? Invalidating all fixes it. Well, it's still going to be slow, but that fixes that issue. 
and we'll try another reboot just in case we got unlucky. It's okay. So clearly, th we know for sure this is related to uh, paging then. Or related to um, uh, caching. So if I do this. Oh, do I have to do that on the back end too to make sure it flushes those? I'm just gonna just gonna YOLO bookend this. Validate both before we do the dirty walk. Nope. Okay, that means we're doing the invalidate incorrectly then. Yeah, that would make no sense to have to bookend it. Um Okay. What am I doing wrong here? 2U64. That's the global. And that works. If the VM entry execution... Um... If the VM entry with the enable execution control is set to one, would fail due to the EPTP value, then VM fail. Otherwise, invalidate them associated with EPTP that. Invalidates all mappings associated with these bits of the EPT pointer Specified in the inv ept descriptor. Um, and that's the descriptor. And we got the eptp ept.table, that's what we pass. Oh! Do I need those bits? Do I need those bits? Except technically is not the same. Yes! All right, is the perf going to be improved, though? No. <laughs> oh, okay, so it's not that. I don't know what it would be then. Unless it's something the VMs are doing themselves that we can't control. Um, yeah, now we're doing that. Damn, I thought that would have been it. Sync interval, let's put this down to 50 millis. Merge in the stats, merge the frequencies. What else would it be? What would not scale? Um, so here's a fuzz loop, worker fuzz case, okay. So this is single core, 760. All cores. Uh, 
The expected number is at least 760 times 4. So like 3,000. Um, but we're spending all of our time inside the VM, right? We're spending the time inside the VM. Okay, um, we need VM exit counts. And I'll put this back to this, and then we'll have statistics, VM exits, number of VM exits. I don't think this is hurting me, but maybe it is. Maybe tracking these VM exit reasons is hurting me. I'm just gonna count that out quickly. I'm not printing it or saving it anyways. Master.vm exits plus equals self.vm exits. Oh, I'm not clearing these. Whoops. Well, in this case, I can just do self is uh, self is default default. Okay, view exits. And then here we'll do one we view exit. We'll just do um, self.stats.vm exits plus equals one. So we're gonna track how many how many times we do a VM exit. And I bet it's a fuck ton. Yeah, that's a, a, a stupid amount of VM exits. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess we're doing the this stuff, the preemption timer stuff. We'll set that to a much larger number. See if that drops it down quite a bit. It probably should. Oh yeah, now VM exits is tiny. So it's not directly VM exits. I think it's just what the VMs are doing. It's just literally what the VMs are doing. Whatever they're doing just happens to not scale, which is strange because they should be isolated, but um, I don't know. So if we look at the stats, VM exits is quite low. And we're spending almost all of our time inside the VM. Yeah, 20, 25x the time in the VM. Now, it's possible that outside of all of that tracking, we're spending much more time. So what I'm going to do is um, fuzz start is CPU RDTSC. And then at the very end, I will do self.fuzz cases, uh, self.stats plus equals total time, uh, dot total cycles plus equals CPU RDTSC minus start time or whatever I called it, fuzz start. So now we're going to have like, uh, okay struct statistics, and then we'll have total cycles. This is gonna be very close to the total cycles spent fuzzing. This is total cycles. And reset our local stats. So I'll merge them in, and then we'll see the masters. Come on, let me reset. There we go. 
Okay. Reset. So now we know if anything's not being accounted for. Uh, okay. But we have that total cycles now. And total cycles... I guess it's possible we lose that on this sink. Yeah, I'm going to put this here because on a sinking case, we actually lose total cycles. So I'm just going to make sure that gets updated this is technically more correct. It means that we don't actually see the perf loss here, but this is happening once every like second. It's so unbelievably rare. And I don't know if that rebooted or not. Come on. Um, there we go. Okay, now we have total cycles, and we can see how much time is spent inside the VM and resetting. And if we're spending all our time in the VM, there's really nothing we can do. With the exception of maybe decreasing the amount of things that we um, write. But here we go, this is real data. This is the, yeah, VM cycles. I think everything's basically accounted for here. This is the amount of CPU time that we spend inside the VM. 96% of the CPU time spent inside the VM, which is basically uh, those statistics come from uh, VM run. So this is where we have perf improvements. Swapping in a new VM pointer, which will not happen. It'll only happen once. Init only happens once. So at this point, setting up our timers, writing our guest things, um, disabling interrupts is fine. Writing MSRs, ooh, this is probably killing me. I think I only want to write those if they changed. Enable interrupts. Do all this shit. The VM reads should be pretty cheap. We don't actually know if they changed. Oh, we do know if they changed, because the VM can't change them. VM cannot change these right now. So this is the only place that we really have perf improvements, right? Is this VM exit stuff. Um... This should not be expensive in here. None of this stuff should be expensive. What about locks? Not getting that. So it's just run. And then what I'm going to do temporarily, just so we can see, writing CR2, CR8, those should be pretty cheap. But I'm going to do this only once on init. I will set those up. I just want to see. Those are expensive, right? MSRs are very expensive. Z. There we go. Holy shit. Holy shit. That's where our perf was. Holy ever-loving fuck. Well, the question is, are these VMs actually doing anything, though? Maybe they're not actually running to the end. Um, we make the VM... Yeah, they, they might be failing when they hit the first... I, I, don't, think, I don't think this is actually it. I, I think we're... Um, I don't think our registers are set up when we make this. Well, I guess, yeah, the first time we run, 
by the time we run the first time, okay, I think that might be where our perf is then. Um, wow, oh yeah, we, we disabled coverage, okay. That's reporting coverage. And then report coverage is not doing anything. So we'll have this actually report coverage to the server, which is currently zero. And we'll get to see how much cover we ha coverage we have. Print statistics, we can get rid of that. All right, here we go. Coverage looks a little bit low. Okay, so coverage is 9993. Oh, yeah, we set that to really high, didn't we? Um, this. We'll set that to FF. We'll observe a little bit more coverage with this. There we go. That reset. There it comes the reset, and then coverage, 9993. Okay, that might just be the amount of coverage that we have now. And let me move this down and determine this. We can use this to see if um, we can see if we get more coverage. If we get, oh. Okay. I do think it is working. Um, yeah, and there goes our perf. It's that. It's the right MSRs. Okay. Um, EPT we don't need. Test fuzzer we do need. Main we don't need open. VTX we need open. Core locals we don't need open. Mini dump we don't need open. Okay, this is everything that we're currently working on. So, um, now we're gonna optimize this loop. I hope this doesn't come out as stupid, but are these literal VMs as in virtual machines? I read your post on Vectorized Emulation and uh, got that question when you explained the terminology. In this case, these are actual VMs. These are real hardware accelerated VMs. Um, so these fields we have to pull out. These we don't have to worry about because they can't get changed. And then these, I think we'll have the like, hmm. So I don't know if those change, right? There's no way for me to know if those change or not. I think VM reads and VM writes are actually pretty cheap. So as long as I'm not doing read MSRs in a hot loop, read MSR. Oh, well, we got, a, we got one there. That's, that happens once. I'm just looking through this whole file. Okay, happens once, happen once. All these things don't matter. Those are in a knit. This happens only once on a knit. This happens every fuzz case currently. Okay, right MSR. Happens once. Happens once because this is in a knit right now, and we actually need to change that to be more correct. Um, and that happens once. So it's only these right MSRs. Okay. So this is correct in this very specific case, but it's not generically correct. What I'll need to do is I'll need to basically, um, I'll need to determine if things are changing. So let's go to FFF and we'll set the, we'll set the coverage to, oh, I don't need page table. I need EPT open, but whatever. Um, preempt. We'll set this to a lot of Fs. 
just so we know that that's not really part of our overhead in our benchmark right now. Okay, uh, 22,600, and then what's our sync rates? Yeah, let's set this to every 50 milliseconds we'll sync. I don't think that's gonna hurt, perf. Shouldn't. Okay, now we have to wait longer, because that. Wow. That FFF, that's a lot of Fs then. I guess we'll go to three Fs. Okay, this is now, we should be able to reboot that easier. Okay, nice. So this one's up, running, all the VMs running, all the cores running. Uh, 226, and this is syncing every 50 millis. Yeah, every 50 milliseconds, they sync with the performance, uh, the um, the statistics, and then the stats get reported here, and that's what I'm seeing here. So I'm basically seeing that performance. Um, okay, so let's set this to 250. So only 250 millis is our sync rate. Okay, reset, first fuzz case, first fuzz case complete, and they're running. Um, that really didn't have an effect on the perf, not too surprised. I'm on a local network, so the latency of UDP is pretty low here. Okay, so this is uh, 22,600 per second. Now let's see what it is on a single core. So if we extrapolate, we're running on a quad core, so if I take... 22,600, you know, let's say 22,800, uh, let's say just, yeah, 23,000, which is above what we've ever seen, but we're going to say 23,000 divided by 4, uh, 5,750. Um, so we'll go to single core, and we should be 5,750 is the one core mark. And I bet we'll be lower than that. We'll be at like 45, 4,300. Wow, we aren't scaling. God damn it. Okay, now, um, maybe now we're actually bottlenecking on memory. <laughs> We might actually be bottlenecking on memory now. Um, yeah, we'll have the reset. Um, let me restored is zero u sixty four, and then restored plus equals four thousand ninety six, and then I'll just print this. It's going to spew. It's going gonna, it's gonna to spew, spew real bad. Uh, and to fix the spew, time, sleep, 100, 100 millis. Just so I don't lose access to the server. Sometimes if I spew too much, the IP my serial gets fucked. They stored 90.112. Why are some of the first ones different? This is what I expect to see. Um, Kronzius base. We want to set these on a res on that reset. That's what we want to do. I think we're breaking our cases right now. So, yeah, I don't think the right MSRs was the perf loss actually. Validate the EPT. 
And then we reestablish the guest registers. Okay, that fixes it. So we're doing the wrong thing. Okay, 782. And now we can see if we have perf back. And I don't think we do. I bet we're back to the 1500 we had before. We just we, we actually broke the the logic. It wasn't doing the same thing. We'll be back to 1500, I think. Yeah, 1600. So it's not the right MSRs. I I don't know. I don't know what's causing that to not scale. Um, all right, I'm gonna look into this more tomorrow. But I need to figure out why this isn't scaling. Maybe it is. Maybe it is memory. Um. I guess I can. DR seven. Okay, so that's setting all those. What I can do is, I'm gonna see what our scaling is when these VMs don't do anything. So assuming these VMs do nothing and basically dirty nothing. Uh, whoa. 112K a second? That sounds really low. I don't have like some debug shit in there, do I? Yeah, I'm getting like no scaling. Okay. What if I get rid of these right MSRs? Okay. All right, let's... Actually, we have this isolated down nice, which is good. So now we can play around with things and we can go until we see 400,000. Um, run. Do this. One time init. I don't set init. Yep. Init is true. Set the preemption timer. Is it like the FX save and restore? Is it this kernel GS base? Reading that. Maybe reading these. I know that we need those, right? I, I know that those are critical. But let's see. Does that put us to 400,000? No. So it's not that. So what the fuck doesn't scale here? If I did, if I return a VM exit, what kind of VM exit can I return here? Um, VM exit timeout. There we go. I'm just gonna run return timeout. Okay, so Okay. Uh 5.176 million. And then if we go back to this, this should be like 1 million. That would be linear scaling. We're basically trying to figure out what we're bottlenecking on. This should be like 1 million. Yep, less than a million. That means we're getting greater than 4x scaling. Perfect. So it's not that. So now I can go past this one time in it, and we'll put a timeout here. And then here, we gotta A-B test these, basically. I don't understand how that's faster.
I actually don't understand how that got faster. How's that faster than having it just return right away? What the fuck? Let me try this again. Paste. Build. Building. Run. How is that slower? <laughs> How in the actual fuck is that slower? I have no idea how it's faster to... How would that ever be faster? I... What? What? Does this scale linearly? Yes, so that scales. That skill, that's a 6x. Okay, so we know it's not that. Now we can program some of these timers. Set up all this shit. Uh, we'll basically initialize everything about the VMs. And we'll see if this scales. Twelve mil. So the number here that we're looking for is like two mil. Correct. So we're still scaling linearly. Now we're gonna enter the VM, exit the VM, mark that it was launched, and then we're just gonna return. We're just gonna get the fuck out of there and we're gonna return. Okay, 900k a second. Um, Russ is like QT, simple hello world is three to six megs. It, it, it isn't. Maybe if you've statically linked with the entire library, but it, it isn't that big. Um... Okay, so let's see if this scales. So that's scaling. Okay, so we know it's not any of that. And that's entering and exiting. Okay, restoring the state then. Five point seven mil. Once again, not the case. And then VM exit here. If instead of returning VM exit, I just return timeout. I think Rust will delete all that code though, so I'm a little bit worried about that. But let's see what this does. Five point seven mil. Okay, so that's scaling, which then means it stops scaling the second I start doing things. And it's expected that I lose a lot of that perf, which is fine. Mm. 
now we're at 112k. So we lose our scaling. Huh. Yeah, if you want a small binary, just just use a LTO. Um, unless they have some regression right now, which is possible. That being said, I don't think anyone cares about binary size too much. If you care about binary size, you're probably not using the standard library. Okay, so, dude, I have no idea where I'm losing my perf. I don't get it. Am I doing translate a lot? Translate should happen like pretty rarely. Maybe I'm hitting a shit ton. Nope. Go stable. Read MSR. That's cheap. Rate CR. That's cheap. That's cheap. These are not cheap, but that doesn't matter too much. And then V makes it filter, which I don't have one installed. And then I break out a little loop. I think just fundamentally these VMs are thrash and caches. It'd be the only thing that makes sense. But wait, but they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything right now. Um, right? So we have them just hitting an int three. Okay, what if I disable my restoration? Wait, there's our perf again. 2.9 million. 2.9 million. Um. What? What? So if I go single core, does this drop to like 700k? Yes. So I have scaling. It's 
It's something related to the restores. So, maybe the EPT updating the dirty bits is really slow? I don't think so. 108k. Okay, big problems. What if I just don't do the copy, but I do everything else? So this won't this will actually not restore the page, but it will still do the get page. Yes, it's it's get page off the master. Oh, is it just for each dirty page entirely? Huh. Uh, kernel source, EPT. Okay. For each dirty page. Present is zero. What if I don't clear those pages? Holy shit, and then if I clear those pages, we get smoked. Clearing the access and dirty bits. Why though? Why though? What if I leave the access and dirty bits, but I do the restore? It's like a really weird way of doing it, but I don't clear the AD bits. So I always restore everything I've ever seen. And that's faster. Why is setting the access and dirty bits so slow? The processor is doing something really weird on those pages. Why would that be the case? Clear accessed, EPT dirty. I'm just gonna clear the dirty bit. Wow, and what if I clear the access bit only? I feel like touching these EPT pages is, is like catastrophically expensive. Wow. If it's dirty, clear the dirty bit. It's only on the last level. This will be like 800,000 a second. Three hundred K. And if I don't do it at all, it's two million. Now the question is, is it's not clearing those bits that it's expensive, it's setting them. Wow.
That's crazy. Why would that be the case? Am I competing with other cores to clear these? No. If I go single core, I don't... It doesn't go faster. This is like 70k a second? Yeah, 90k a second. I don't get it. I don't get it. If I do nothing. Four twenty one, clear access and dirty. Dude, I don't, I don't understand that. I really don't, I don't get it. I don't get it one bit. I feel like clearing access and dirty bits is like catastrophically expensive on Intel then. That's insane. There's no way. There's no way. Set the sync interval to 250 is fine. And it's not reset. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Seattle. Reset over total. Eight percent reset. Okay, this over total. That goes to thirty seven percent. Because the VM cycles dramatically drops. Wow. VM cycles. VM cycle per fuzz case. 5,300. And when we did the reset, this was this many over this many. Holy shit. I guess we're maybe just doing a lot of sparse memory accesses. But I'm not actually restoring those pages. Why would that, why would it be almost uh, like an order of magnitude longer if I clear the access and dirty bits? I'm only doing four accesses. VM exits is the same, right? I'm doing basically one VM exit per. Yep, one to one. And in this case, it's also one to one. Uh, 
Yep, that's the same. That is bizarre. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what this is. If I do that, I never set bits in the tables. My view makes it is just a breakpoint. If you don't reset fully, you're still executing the whole program. In this case, I'm not. I'm just hitting a breakpoint. I'm doing effectively nothing. Caches are enabled. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I'm not even, I'm not even close to understanding what's going on here. This is a, I don't think this is a my fault thing. I think this is literally the CPU. And I, I don't know if I can work around it. Um, this is uh, cycles per fuzz case. 10.4. Master dot fuzz. Uh, VM cycles. VM cycles per fuzz case divided by master dot fuzz cases. So I'll have the fuzz, the cycles per VM cycles and reset. And I'll have VM exits. Okay, and this looks fine. Almost no VM exits. But then the second I clear the access and dirty bits, which is only on four pages, four pages, goes to 35,000. On VM execution time. What the fuck? I'm guaranteed to call the next level of tracking. I think the processor is just really slow at setting the access and dirty bits. If I only do this on the final level, what happens? Still trash, but better.
Okay, um, so now the theory can be... Now we can turn off the axis and dirty tracking. Um, one shift six. Four level EPT, we're gonna turn off the dirty bit tracking. Wow. I didn't have this problem on AMD. That's a pretty massive limitation to Intel. That's abysmal. It's on a real processor. Okay, what if I don't set this? So 5,000 cycles, that sounds about right. Honestly, 5,000 seems pretty high. Probably the X saves. Saving the floating point state is probably killing me. I... It's only four pages. Four separate pages, so... What is that? Let's say four times four levels. Um, then I go into the next level. Do I need to like flush that? Setting this flag causes processor access to guest paging structures to be treated as writes. Trina's rights cause the processor to set the dirty flag, may cache that information. So basically, if, if there's a lot of sparse accesses, meaning that a lot of, a lot of things are getting dirtied but not used twice, we're just gonna have ass performance, and there's 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 literally nothing we can do about it. That's insane. Five thousand minus that, thirty thousand. Four pages being dirtied. Four levels per page. Worst case scenario, it's taking two thousand cycles per fucking page. 2,000 cycles per page for the processor to set the access and dirty bits. That is unreal. It's crazy.
I don't know if there's like microcode that I can get to improve that. That's that's insane. On AMD, it was, it was basically instant. There was almost no cost. Um. Access to data write and for any byte to be written. Oh, wait a minute. That might not be the case. If I don't set that, then... Hmm, but it's not... I'm not spending reset time. Yeah, I'll still have to go through the reset path here. Uh, less is bit one is clear in any of the EPT paging structures used to translate the guest physical address into. Guess paging structure has an EPT violation. Processor accesses to guest paging structure entries are treated as as writes. Yep. I don't think there's anything we can do here. I think we're just at the whim of the processor. <laughs> Validate EPT. This, we'll just set these because we can. So I, I don't think this is going to be the bottleneck. And I don't do the read MSRs because they don't matter. Um, I think I have Am I not hitting a read MSR? Read MSR. Yeah, I think there's just nothing we can do. Um, well, <laughs> that sucks. Maybe on a different uh, architecture, wouldn't be as big of a problem, or different microarchitecture. That's insane. Not using restored. It's crazy. Does it, do I need to like convince it that it has exclusive access to that page table? Cause wow, it's insane. When I have multiple cores on it, just it's like it's like getting a lock on the physical memory bus. Th that's what this number looks like. This looks like a physical memory bus lock.
Um, are you just using printing as a debug method or for breakpoint as well? Just for uh, just for debugging. I'm trying to figure out where I'm losing this perf. And I think. I think those dirty bit updates are getting like a global lock on the processor memory bus. There's just nothing I can do about it. Paging is enabled. Are there any bits I can set anywhere? Can I convince this that it's exclusive access? Can I make the entire system without breakpoints? What do you mean by that? Access, read, write. And she's clear. Have you used breakpoints on this project? I, I, I don't know what you mean by breakpoints. Have I like used a debugger to debug it? No. EPT type. I gave it a type. Ignore pat memory type for this page. Specified bits two to zero. Wait. The memory type used for any such reference in the EPT paging structure. Oh my god. Do I have caches disabled on that? Does the EPT pointer Uh I mean that's it feels like uncaching. Three three. What if I just orn a six here? EPT dot table. I'm gonna orn a six. I wonder if it's treating this whole structure as uncacheable or accesses to this. Wow, I mean, it's, then the effective, have it as right back, yeah, that's what I set, I set the entries as right back, I didn't know the whole table had a right back field, but that's totally what it is, I guess, I, um... For the EPT paging structures, it's the these bits. So basically, the paging structures are marked uncacheable. So on the processor walk, those. Um, then for the guest physical addresses, it's the pats combined with the EPT type. Um, it's only the last level. And then it's a mix of the pat. And I'm fine with the pat, because the pat is, is going to be correct on these. Uh, so we set those as right back. 
if, if paging is disabled. If paging is enabled, then it is the memory type from that, the pat memory type. And then my pat MSR is going to be, it's just normal. I'm not doing anything weird there. But yeah, that's the problem. It's very hidden. I, we read that earlier. That was kind of confusing to us. But the EPTP has to have the caching bits there. Otherwise, the page table itself is accessed as uh, uncached. I feel like I didn't see that in... This is a an EPT PML4 table comprises of this. Is selected using the physical address. But that's the PML E. I mean, clearly that had an effect, right? If I don't set that, if I don't set that, then my perf goes in the shitter unless I change these things back, but I don't think I did. So clearly those bits matter. It's very strange to me that they don't mention that when they talk about that. Like they don't really describe the EPT. But yeah, I guess you have to just read that other section because it doesn't really mention those bits. But those are absolutely, that's setting it right back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That fixes the perf issue. That's pretty fucking nuts. I didn't I didn't know that. Um yeah, that changes the axis of the table itself. Problem solved. Um That is back to its original shape. Undid everything in that file. And here we go. And we're good. Okay, we did it. We did it. We fixed it. Thanks everyone who helped out there. Fuck yeah. Um, can get rid of these. It makes it reasons I'm not tracking anymore. Okay, so now we're getting 450,000 a second single and then this should put us at like 2 million minimum um here we go reset so it should put us at about 2 million yes and it does it actually puts us over a 4x significantly over a 4x which is what i would have expected um perfect so now we're scaling with that and now we can set rip back so now we're actually doing not fuzzing but we're running that vm um, cool. And then I'll reset this. Um, I actually want to reset this with this off. Get that stuck. And then here. Okay, reset. I bricked it. I must have reset at the wrong time. All right. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't think it would access those as uncacheable, but, huh, makes sense. Okay. Well, we made a lot of improvements, anyways, while we were debugging that. Reset that to an ungood state. All right, so now we have full determinism. And yeah, we could technically, we could technically decrease a little bit of our overhead. So we're still doing, like, these right MSRs are pretty expensive because right MSRs are serializing. I could do those only if, uh, only if the values have been observed to change. Like I can have the current commit state. And then if something changes, which I could check very cheaply, we could write those out. Most expensive to write is EFER. Yeah, in this case, um, EFER is just managed for us luckily. So we don't have to worry about that. But these ones, I don't want to run these every case. But 
But I think a lot of our perf cost is in the Vima exit itself. All right, so here we go. And this is now running. <coughs> yeah, and yeah, we're running, yep, 3,800 a second. Beautiful. And that's with all cores. So if I turn off the cores, then I expect to be somewhere slightly below 1,000 if I'm getting true linear scaling with number of cores. Because I have a uh, quad core. So if this is like, so we're getting 3,800, and then we divide this by whatever this number is. Okay, we're getting a little bit sublinear. And I guess I'm, I think that's probably fair. We're getting 3.45x speed up. JavaScript. <laughs> Lol. Okay, yeah, uh, we're not getting full linear. I don't know if there's any strong reason for that. Oh, are we hitting memory bandwidth now? I know I keep saying that, but maybe, maybe we're now hitting memory bandwidth. <laughs> um, let's see. This is like 700k or something, 750k, I think. Uh, let me dirty is zero. We keep, we keep putting this code in and out, in and out. So this is how many we restored, and then I'll just print dirtied this, dirtied, and then create time sleep 100 millis so we don't end up spamming. Okay, yep, 782336. So we can see if we're saturating memory at this point, and I think we're very, very close. In which case, I uh, there's, in which case I'm just there's nothing I can do, right? So I'm gonna say, in this test, I have that saved in my calculator, so I don't forget that number, and then we'll see what perf we're getting. But it was like what 3,800 a second. Yeah, 3,800, so divide that, divide that, 0.74 is a little under a mag, right? Uh, 38, let's say 38.22 a second, that's 2.8 gigs a second, um, shouldn't be hitting bandwidth issues, um, I don't think so, that's quite low, and all that should fit basically in L3, Um, so I guess let's report these statistics. When you report stats to the server, here we go. Fuzz cases, we'll report the fuzz cases, we'll report the total cycles. Um, so we're gonna have, uh, we'll clean this up first. Total cycles. VM cycles, reset cycles, and now we can, we'll send these up to the server so we can actually see what these numbers are, and we'll know approximately the speed of these things, um, shared, folk TP, source, <sighs> total cycles, VM cycles, Reset cycles. We could technically convert those to times at this stage. Because the... <laughs> the receiver side isn't really going to know what to do with the cycles, but I don't I don't care too much. It's not too big of a deal. Y'all figure out what the bottleneck is? Yeah, we had... Um, basically, all the accesses to the page tables were uncacheable to the processor because I, I, I didn't know that. There are some bits that I have to set in the bottom part of the uh, uh, EPT pointer. 
We did set up VPID. Um, okay. So I gotta change the server. Technically this will now fail. Oops. Okay, so total cycles, um, VM cycles, and uh, reset cycles. Okay. And then same thing as this shit. Oops. Total cycles. All these. Okay. Then we'll synchronize these. Whoa. Total cycles. Total cycles. And then VM cycles. Reset cycles. Okay, so now I store that information. 168. Client doesn't have these. Uh, total cycles. Reset cycles. Uh, VM cycles. Failed to deserialize. Yeah, because that's running the old old kernel. So this should be fine. Reset. Okay. Um yeah, that's working. We're just not printing those stats now. So now we can do um let's cycle percent is equal to um or er, reset percent is equal to clients dot reset cycles as f64 divided by client dot total cycles as f64 so you have the reset percent and we have the vm percent this is vm cycles vm 8.4 Reset 8.4. Guess we have to do this. Um, it's fuzz cases per second, then the IP. So the reset, uh, VM percent. And the reset percent. So now we will have all the statistics. And we fucked that up, didn't we? What's going on here? Okay. This should be good. All right. Uh, resets. So now we're going to get the stats. Non. Yep, that's fine. We haven't gotten a stat report yet. Because it hasn't completed that first fuzz case. Okay, let's reset it. Oh, deadlock. Deadlock. Okay, 1021. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Very much so a problem. Stats. It's like, why the fuck is that not working? <laughs> Pretty quite 
pretty quite wrong there. Stats reset cycles. Okay, so now we're going to have all the perf numbers sent up to us on the server. There we go. We got cases, and now we can see the percentage of CPU time that's spent inside the VM and spent resetting. Um, it doesn't necessarily add up to 100 because there's other overheads that are going on. But it'll converge to uh, VM. So basically, the, initially, I spent a lot of time actually downloading the pages for the VM, and that's why that number was so low. But this VM number is going to slowly climb. So we're spending about 87% of our CPU time. Actually, it's probably, about, it's probably literally about 93% of our CPU time in the VM. So now we know where our CPU time is being spent. 90% inside the VM is pretty good. Um, it's, it's hard to beat that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we're going to cross over 90 here as this averages out. And yep, there we are, over 90. That's cleanly over 90. Resets are looking pretty good. 5.6% of CPU time spent resetting. Not bad at all. Um, yeah, so there's not really much room for improvement there. I could print VM exits. If I'm doing a lot of VM exits, then it's possible that I'm spending time outside of the actual VM execution. Um, let me do that. Let me let me tighten the statistics on here. Those are pub. Um, we'll make VM cycles pub, and then we'll pass that into the VM stuff. Actually, we'll just return that out. VM cycles plus equals. So we do that down here. We record the time in the VM, but we're going to go even tighter. We're going to go right around here. So this is going to be right before we enter our assembly to context switch into the VM. IT is CPU RDTSC. And then this is uh, VM cycles is equal to CPU RDTSC minus IT. So... Uh, Record the time spent in the VM. Now, obviously, there's still the context switch stuff. I could get the RDTSC a little bit closer, but getting it past some of this context switching stuff would be annoying because I have to I have to be concerned about what I'm clobbering. Um, I guess I could literally do it right before I load the these last few things. And then save RDX. I don't know. This is pretty close. This the the only thing that this really includes is the F save and then all these memory accesses. So But if we end up having something really expensive like these, uh those won't be those will be detected as kinda fucky. So what we can do is we can set let VM cycles. And this is uh, time spent inside the VM. Okay, VM cycles, 1163. So we assign to that there. And then, so now we're not recording all this shit. And then VM exit, we'll just return VM cycles as well as the VM exit. Simple. Then we gotta fix this. VM exits, VM cycles. Now we have a much tighter loop there. So now our stats are even more accurate and they include even less of the overhead. So if we saw like 10% CPU time in the VM, we would know that um, we probably have a lot of overhead on our VM resets. Or on our like context switching to and from the VM, but that's not going to be the case. Basically, we no longer include the like reading and writing in those MSRs, which we don't need to do every case. But yeah, th these numbers are fine, right? These numbers are totally fine. Yeah. 
Yeah. This is basically saying that I, I, there's really nothing I can do to make this more than 10% faster. I'm limited to literally what's happening on hardware. Like the accesses that are happening, the, the cache misses that are happening, the branch mispredictions due to the software that's running that is under test. There's nothing I can really do to make that software better. Um, so yeah, this looks pretty solid. The reset times look fantastic. And yeah, we're we're over ninety percent. There we go. So yeah, we're we're like I guess there's like four percent unaccounted, so we could get like a four percent speed up here if we change some of the MSRs. Now that's not always the case, right? Sometimes you, if you change something, it, it's pretty dramatic. Um. So these right MSRs, we can do these once. On reset. So when we reset, we can write those MSRs. So the first time we come through, we'll set the MSRs, and then subsequent times that we reset the VM, we'll set those MSRs. And then at that point, this code does nothing. It just checks that something hasn't changed. That's free. That's four cycles. This check is about two cycles. Actually, one cycle, because it fuses that. This is a couple branches. This, these are like probably... It's probably like six cycles total here. We got a branch, couple comparisons, couple checks. Uh, of unconditional VM write if we have a preemption timer, which we do. These VM writes are pretty cheap. Then we go into here. This assertion is free because it's uh, compile time proven. Same with this one. Compile time proven doesn't exist in the actual code. Um, disable interrupts, basically free. Writing CR2 and CR8, not necessarily free. Um, but we kind of have to do them. We could do them only when... Th these are also serializing instructions. So we technically only want to do these if the CR2 changes compared to what we have. Um, but we still have to get the, We have no notification of if the CR2 or CR8 change. So we kind of have to read them out every time. The kernel GS base, we kind of have to read every time because that could have changed. Could it have changed? Yes, because uh, swap GS. Um, we could add a swap GS hook, and then we could do this lazily. Because right now we're reading this MSR every time we VM exit versus every time that the GS actually changes. Um, so we could do like swap GS hooks. But that is like, it's really hard to, like swap GS you do a lot. So it's actually really hard to say if it would be faster to hook that versus unconditionally do this. Like the question is, this read MSR is probably uh, 20 to 40 cycles. And the VM exit itself is like 4,000 cycles. So basically, for it to be cheaper to hook the swap GS, I would have to have a, I would have to have like, like 50 VM exits for every swap GS, which is never gonna happen. Um, reading is cheaper though. Yeah, reading is super cheap. Yeah, I, I technically only have to change that if it changes. Launched. Um, these VM reads we just have to do. And then this is pretty cheap. We're just checking a value, and then we're going to decode what it is. All of this stuff is, is pretty cheap. So, yeah, there's really not a huge amount of room for improvement there, with the exception of basically not always setting these uh, CRs. Because those are serializing. I don't think write CR8 is serializing. Actually, all writes to CR should be serializing, but I that one might get a special exemption. That being said, we are bottlenecking entirely on what the software is actually doing. So that's really only changing our overhead on VM exits, and our overhead on VM exits is already extraordinarily low. 
Um, yeah, we could uh, we could try and use the um, we could use one of the X save ops, and then we only differentially save and restore the things that are actually used between the transitions. That's uh, or actually X save C might be the fastest one now. Yeah, I think X save C is the the best one. Move CRA is not serializing. Okay. Move CR2 is serializing, because I, I, I know that because I use that for, um, uh, Move CR2 is one of the fastest serializing operations you can do on x86. It's better than like CPU ID or write MSR, and it typically works inside of a VM without having a VM exit happen. So write CR2s are actually really, really nice. Um... But yeah, serializing there kind of sucks, to be honest. So. But I don't have a good way of knowing. Oh, you're saying like literally do this. If CPU read CR2 is not equal to this. And then if CPU read CR8 is not equal to this, because those reads are going to be cheap, and those shouldn't serialize. Because uh, I was trying to figure out how I would actually know whether I should write to it, because I can't cache that information because my OS can change these. So if the CR2 is changed, then make sure it's correct. So then we only pay that read cost. I mean, this is not going to be noticeable in the uh, perf. But this is potentially noticeable in the, um, if we have like a lot of VM exits or something that's potentially noticeable. But other than that, we could change uh, to use xsave opt. But I think I use this explicitly just because um, that's what I'm getting from the mini dumps within a margin of error. Yeah, it's it's just noise. Now, if I turn up the exit frequency, like if I'm single stepping and I want to get a trace, that'll actually be a pretty significant change. Um, X save stuff, I, I definitely need to do that. These VM writes I have to do. All of these I have to do. There's nothing else here I can really omit except for making these X save uh, S's. And those are actually backwards compatible. So if I look at, what is the fastest X save now? Because there's X save. So there's FX save, there's X save, there's X save opt, there's X save S, there's X save C. So FX save is the old legacy one. X save is the new replacement. X save opt optionally saves things depending on if they were used since the last save. X save S, I can't remember what X save S does. I think that's the most recent one. X save C is save compressed. <laughs> so these are like all the different ones. Um, manually saving and restoring the registers is typically faster than doing any one of these, but if you don't know the entire state, you kind of have to do these. Um, so we could look at, XSAVE-C is very bleeding edge with compaction. I think XSAVE-C is the best for caching, but not necessarily because it's the most condensed memory, but I don't think it's necessarily the fastest. Um, always uses the compacted format. Unlike this and this, it clears bits in BV that correspond with things that are clear in FPM. Um, oh, interesting. Because um, XSAVE is actually backwards compatible with the um, with the FX save. X save start with the X save header, or the. This is actually in the Intel. Um, this is not in the systems manual. I don't think. I think this one is in the normal uh, software developer manual, because it's not a uh, actually X save C. I think is kernel level only. And so is X save opt. I think X save you can do in user land, but the rest you cannot. X save C. 
Uh, allocate space for only the state saved to conserve memory usage. Okay. X save S is supervisor state. Are introduced to save and restore supervisor states along with other X save managed states. Um, okay. So then I really just want X save opt, I think. Basically all I care about then. Yeah, I think Xsave Opt is basically the fastest one I can get then. That's only on the save side. It's, it's probably not too significant. I don't need to do the X saves. Uh, S, because I don't have any supervisor state that I care about. Cross the future bitmap, which is the argument you pass in. I think EAX, EDX. And then that's ANDed with XCrow. Um... Similar to that, it differs that from xsave and then it might use the init and modified optimizations performance will be equal to or better than that of xsave so we could try it um i don't know if i actually set up the xcr i probably do um oh i don't so I don't I don't think I even enable XSave in my OS. Um RGI XSave. Um Yeah, and then I'd have to conditionally handle this shit. I mean, I'm going to run this like any processor that I run this on will probably have XSave and XSave opt. I can't really imagine that I'd ever run this on something without xsave opt. But yeah, um, that's looking pretty clean. Let's take a look at the, let's look at the um, overhead performance by causing a breakpoint. So this is just a breakpoint in a loop. Here we go. Uh, so this is basically our maximum performance, assuming we're doing nothing. We're spending half our time resetting, half our time in the VM. Um, there's really nothing we can improve on either of those. We can use page modification logging, but PML requires that you um, translate the table entries, so I think it's actually slower than doing a bulk reset. So, but yeah, this is looking pretty good. Uh, 2.6 million per second on a quad core. And then if we go, if we drop this down to single core, and I'm just gonna record this, uh, two, six, seven, seven, that's the number. And then I'll reset, and then I'll divide by this number. And then let that stabilize, it looks pretty stable. Four, five, one, seven, hundred. Yeah, so we're getting a 6x speed up even though we're on a quad core, and that's mainly hyper threading, which is what I'm typically used to, is getting like a. basically getting like 75% of the performance of including hyper threads as cores, if that makes sense. So like 50% more than your cores uh, with hyper threading. Um, okay. So that's looking great. This all works. Uh, obviously, I need to parse these things from the mini dump and everything, but this is like, we're, we're fuzzing through kernel stuff and these are exiting right now. Let's print while they're exiting. And if we're printing, let's sleep. But I think these VM exits are, um, they're writing, they're sending an IPI, I think. Yeah, it's accessing uh, 300, which is the, that's self IPI, isn't it? Um, where's my APIC at?
Uh, that's an ICR. Okay, yeah, that's sending an, uh, an IPI. So it is probably doing a self IPI, is what I would guess. Um, it's probably doing that to switch its um, interrupt level. So. I can try and virtualize the APIC, uh, and then it can actually pass this and send that ICR, but I think it's done with our program. Uh, I've never really done the virtualized APIC, so I'm not too comfortable with it, but I know that it does accelerate um, those two at least at a, at a bare minimum. Even a full vapic, you have to. Yeah, I know. I know that it, it basically does like EOI and IPI. X2 APIC has um, optimized self IPIs, which Windows uses a lot. Actually, I think you might have to handle IPIs. Yeah, I think you have to handle IPIs. Oh, VIR. Virtualized APIC registers, uh, TPR, interrupt request register. And then the ICR. Okay, so the ICR is virtualized. Um, I would have to make sure that I don't allow it to send to other cores. So you have to like set up, you set the virtual APIC page up and then you have to, um, you need to set the, you need to basically set the EOI virtualization, self IPI virtualization. That's only for um, X2 APIC. Oh. Huh, they self IPI virtualize. Interesting. Need to pass through the VAPIC page, the physical physical address, but I also need to make sure that it can't send a, a IPIs to other processors. And I forget how you do that. Oh, and move to and from uh, CR8, I can also virtualize. Um. Don't I have to tell it like which processors are present? Because I, I don't want it to be able to send like a an IPI to an actual actual core. Okay, three hundred. If virtual interrupt delivery, VM execution control is one, checks the value of uh, VICR is low to all of these. Um, edge trigger, upper half is not that. It performs a self IPI. Okay, so it'll, it'll, it'll virtualize self IPIs, but not others. Any of the items, or if any of those are false, it causes an APIC write VM. Okay, so as long as it's doing a self IPI, it's virtualized. But if it's doing a remote IPI, that makes sense. I would have to handle that because otherwise it's gonna fuck off. I think, maybe I'm thinking of AMD's SVM. So I think with AMD's SVM, you could, you could set the like valid Apex. Um, I swear that AMD SVM, you had like a, a table that you set up where you would set the VPIDs of the other cores, and it would it would actually be able to IPI another core uh, without having a VM exit because you would tell it all of the information about like your virtualized uh, uh, fake cores. But yeah, I I just have to allocate a four K page, zero it out, and then map that in right. And then set APIC virtualization. I think that's all it really takes. And then I should make notes. Um, 
if we're going to do a pick vert, then I probably should say, oh, and I think this can virtualize. Can this virtualize the timer? No, I don't think it can. A pick uh, base. Currently, I don't grab that from the mini dump. Okay. This enables the evaluation and delivery of pending virtual interrupts. Also enables the emulation of writes, memory mapped or MSR based as enabled, so the APIC registers that control interrupt prioritization. TPR shadow that allows us to virtualize that by causing the, uh, and then APIC register virtualization for most APIC registers as enabled. Um, four K region that the processor uses to virtualize certain accesses to APIC registers and manage virtual interrupts. The physical address of the virtual APIC page is the virtual APIC address, a sixty-four bit of VM execution control field in that. So we would basically set that. The APIC register virtualization. Yeah, I'm curious if I, I have support for that. I probably do. Um, may virtualize certain fields, blah, blah, blah. All detail, all this shit. All the things we can virtualize. TPR virtualization, that's just CR8. Virtualization of move CR8, which also is writing to that offset and write MSR of the TPR. PPR virtualization. EOI virtualization. Oh, that's cool. That must clear the like IRRs. Self IPI. Right to 300. So I'm guessing that self IPI might be a special case. Virtual IRR. Yeah, it'll set the bit there. I don't know, is this... How much work would this take to set up? I have to allocate a page, I have to zero it out, I have to map that in. Uh, or I don't have to map it in. I don't think you map it into the VM, right? You just, you put it in the VPIC, um I think you just point the page to it. Virtualize APIC, virtual interrupt delivery, and APIC register virtualization are all secondary based controls. Let's go check out what we can set for those. Let's see how many features we have on this machine. Yeah, you just need to give the physical address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You give the physical address, and then we set these bits, right? And then we'll just start getting VM exits for it. Um, oh, use TPR shadow and other virtualization. Wait, is TPR shadow different from? Huh. Is TPR virtualization different than the... Uh... Virtual uh, APIC stuff? TPR is solely just TPR. But what is the enables TPR virtualization and other <laughs> APIC virtualization? <laughs> the fuck does that add? What is the and other? <laughs> Um, okay, let's grab this, because I am currently doing CR8 manually. So 
so I could get rid of these read CR8s and write CR8s because I can just have the I can just use the TPR from the VMCS. I guess they call it TPR and not. Um, I don't want to highlight all. This field only exists. Oh, the virtual APIC address. TPR threshold. Where does it store the TPR? So you need a virtual APIC address if you're doing that? It says that it's only valid if you have TPR. Well, oh, well, you have to have TPR to do virtual APIC. And then TPR threshold. Um, they don't call it CR8, I don't think. Unless that's part of interruptibility state, maybe they whack it in there. TPR threshold? Is that the actual TPR? That's the CR8 value, is the threshold. So if I want to set CR8 to zero, I set TPR threshold to zero. Because I do need to set that to zero. I need to set threshold is only below that old VM exit. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, Isn't, isn't the TPR the, that TPR, uh, if it's less than that, if the VTPR is less than the TPR threshold, we may exit due to that. I see. Move to CR8. So is that still going to use the actual host CPU's CR8 then? Or does it use a different one? I guess it's just the threshold. Isn't that... The fuck? Can I access the local Apex TPR? So I can set the TPR field. Oh, I see. So move CR8 will get virtualized. And then I can access that field in the APIC that I make for it. And that's going to actually be the TPR of whatever I'm, whatever I'm running. That's my interpretation of that. Is I would set in my in the virtualized APIC table. That'll probably update and read and write that TPR instead of using the host one. Fucking hell. They make it... Uh... 
Emulation of the Apex TPR VCR8. I see. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's what that's going to do. So, we just have to... Depends how closely you want to monitor changes. I just need to be able to write the... I need to be able to set the initial TPR value for the VM. I don't care about what it changes to, but I need to be able to set it. And I need the VM to see the same value that it set last uh, without the host, like, overwriting it. So, right now, I manually save and restore CR8 because the, that's what it's currently using. But I'm guessing that if I enable the virtual APIC... I literally, if I want to change the TPR of the guest, I would literally change the TPR field in the APIC, and that would reflect the move to and move from CR8s inside of the guest. Because we already had an issue with that before where we didn't have the TPR set to the, to the right thing for the VM. It was not happy. Which makes sense. Okay, virtual APIC address. Two one two, uh, address of the virtual APIC, and then yeah, we'll just set that. We'll make a virtual APIC on a struct VM. We'll make a fizzcontig, just a page. The virtual APIC for this VM. VAPIC. 691, vapic is a zeroed out region. Okay, and then we'll set that in the init the right once. We'll do a, what's this? Unsafe, okay. VM right, VMCS, virtual apic address self.vapic dot fizzadder I think I call it what do I yeah fizzadder uh, sets the virtual apic base 989 uh, oh yep yeah. ATU 64 okay so that's the physical address of the virtual apic a host physical address Okay, still exiting, of course, because we're not actually virtualizing anything. So we need to set all these things. So to virtualize this, we just set... Um, boy, I'm getting tired. It's fucking eight. Holy shit. Um... Virtual NMIs, uh, don't need that. Preemption timer, okay. Um, so I want to set, use TPR shadow. So this is in proc on. I want TPR shadow on, which is 21. So now we're going to use TPR shadow. Move DR, we don't care about. Well, we actually have DR exiting. Okay, so now we have TPR shadow on, and then we can enable virtualized APIC accesses. Uh, this is on secondary. Enable uh, virtualize APIC accesses. Okay. One shift zero. So I don't know what all that enables right away, but we have the TPR shadow, which is fine at zero, and unhandled exit code 29. 
Oh, we're hitting EPT violations there. So I do need to map that in, don't I? Right? Unless I'm not enabling it correctly. Uh, exit code 29 as well. Let's check out what that is. Oh, APIC access address. We got to set that. <laughs> it's probably zero. <laughs> so this is the APIC access address. OX214. Address to access the APIC at... And I think that's the only thing left. Um, APIC access address. And then this will set it to... Is the same, it's just a placeholder. Okay. That's this, I'm guessing, right? This is all new to me. I've never done the virtual APIC ship before. I'm guessing that's what I want, and now that'll get hooked, and now I won't see, now I'm still seeing the EPT violations for that. Do I need to map that in? I kind of just assumed the processor would hook that access. And then let's see our exit. See on a 29. Exit reasons, a move DR. And why would that happen? Um, why would I be hitting a move DR? Is this actually move DR? It is. I think that is crashing. Um... Okay, so 4K thing, virtual APIC address, may virtualize certain fields, I, I don't understand why I'm getting that why these are failing, and that, that resembles very closely to what I saw before when I was, I guess, I feel like it's tearing down the system, unless it's actually, um, This has its own DR6 and DR7, right? It has its own DR7. What about DR6? It does not. You need both the virtual APIC as well as the APIC ac access page. Virtual APIC is where the TPR exists, offset 80. APIC access is the placeholder. Right, this is the, the access address is just the fee, whatever. Virtual APIC page is where the TPR exists. Yep. And I zeroed out, and I know that zero is actually the TPR that I want to set. But I, I, I don't understand why I would be getting to this state. This. So what do you mean by it's just a placeholder? I pick access.
Um, by causing VM exits on... What are we setting? APIC accesses. Okay. Actually, APIC we don't care about. VPID we have. Register virtualization. Enables virtualization of memory mapped accesses to the APIC uh, by causing VM exits to accesses to a VMM specified APIC access page. It directs memory mapped writes to the APIC access page to the virtual APIC page following them by VM exits. Need to map the APIC access page into the guest address space. I mean, the way that I'm interpreting that, I, I don't have register virtualization on, so I can turn that on. But the way that I interpret that is that it'll just hijack the um, MMIO to that location. And if I do, if I enable in secondary controls, if I enable register virtualization, oh, I this processor doesn't support register virtualization. It's just used to redirect the MMI accesses to the virtual APIC page. Um, well, I guess I don't, I don't have support for register virtualization. Um, as well as the emulation of writes, the APIC registers that control prioritization, which one's that? I maybe have that unless, unless I need to pair this with something else. Yeah, I don't have that either. So I, I basically only have virtual APIC. So I don't have register. Virtualization of memory mapped accesses to the APIC by causing VM exits on accesses to this. So all that does is it just translates the the normal fault into an APIC fault. Is that it? May cause some of the access to be emulated rather than causing VM exits. Let's actually see. Um, Um, access. Where's the blah blah blah? Where's that field? Four. Only exists on virtualized APIC ad accesses. It's just used to redirect MMIO accesses to the virtual APIC page. Blah, blah, blah. Virtualize APIC registers. TPR, this. TPR, EOI. Memory mapped, okay. Once in X APIC mode, uses the linear address, uh, okay. Software uses uh, linear addresses that translate the physical addresses to PFNs in the APIC base MSR. 
VMM can virtualize these memory mapped APIC accesses by ensuring that any access to a linear address that would access the local APIC instead causes a VM exit. This can be done using paging or EPT. Another way is setting virtualized APIC accesses via this. If this is set, the logical processor treats specially uh, treats specially memory accesses using linear addresses that translate to physical addresses in the four kilobyte access page. Using linear addresses that translate to that. So I guess I would need that mapped in. Accesses using linear addresses that translate to physical addresses in the access page. The access page is defined at that in the VMCS. In general, an access to the APIC access page causes an APIC access VM exits. Exits provide the VMM with information about the access causing the VM exits. Um, certain execution controls can virtualize some of these things without a VM exit. In general, this virtualization causes these accesses to be made to the virtual APIC page instead of the APIC access page. So APIC access is the physical page that needs to be mapped in. That'll get translated through EPT. That gives the physical address. That then gets hooked. Um, so what actually gets, what gets virtualized? Um, read access from this causes a, an exit if one of the following is true. That is zero. The access is an instruction fetch. More than 32 bits. It is part of an operation for which the processor already virtualized a write. It's not entirely contained in a low four bytes. Naturally aligned region. If none of the above are true, when a read access is virtualized depends on the setting of the APIC register virtualization. If both of them are zero, a read access is virtualized if, the, if it's TPR, otherwise it causes an exit. If that is zero and that is one, virtual interrupt delivery, that's what we just tried, I think, right? Yeah, so we can't use either of those. Read access is virtualized to that or an EOI. Otherwise, it causes a VM exit. If that is one, read access is virtualized if it is entirely within these following ranges. So register virtualization gives you like everything. Virtualizing writes, okay. TPR set shadow zero. If none of the above are true, whether write access is virtualized depends on the settings of this. If they're both zero, it's virtualized if the page offset is 80. So you can write to the TPR. If that's zero and the delivery is one, then you can use EOI and ICR. And if APIC register virtualization, so basically if you don't have virtual interrupt delivery or APIC register virtualization, you only get TPR virtualization read and writes. Um. Details of this depend on this. Yep. So then it's kind of pointless, <laughs> at least on this processor. I'm guessing my new cores will have it, my new servers. What, what, what processors have this? Um, what 
What? <laughs> you got one 8 bit control register, the TPR. Server CPUs? Yeah, I mean, this is a server CPU that we're on. Latest Xeons support these features. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing my new servers will have it, so I'm not too worried about it. We'll implement that when my new servers come. I guess this is an E3 CPU, so it's probably uh, probably the most nerfed. But yeah, I guess there's really nothing we can do there. So, all right. Well, we'll go back to what works. They pick. Oops. One of those fields we got to change. Uh, proc two on. Bye bye. Why am I getting these now? Oh, TPR Shadow. Okay, we've undone everything. All right. So, yep, we're hitting all those. I guess the virtual APIC turns it into a fault. Does that, ooh, actually, does that decode the, does that help you decode the right contents? Because I actually don't know what it's trying to write to that. I'm trying to access memory. So the question is, does this give me assisted decode? Otherwise, you need a you need to actually decode the instruction there. So this actually might be pretty big then. Um, oops, VM exits. Uh,
Move DR, IO. Here we go. APIC access. Offset of the access inside the page. The access type. Read, write, fetch. If it's due to a guest physical access, this bit is set if it was async, not part of event delivery. Ah, trace output of, of PT. Um, UI virtualization exit qualification set here. For write VM exits, page offset that's being written to. This field receives a linear address that pertains to the VM exits. Um. You get the guest fizz. For IO, guess physical. Undefined if it's a VM exit due to a guest physical access. Guest physical access. Um, APIC rate VM exits. And then one. Self IPI, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, how do I actually know what it's writing? Do, do, do. EPT violations, accesses to this, and that has the exit qualification, exit reason, yep, that one's easy. But does it store any more information here? In the APIC access exit? Yeah, does it, does it let me know anything about uh, what value is being written? Provide a VMM with information about the access causing the VM exit. Um, depends on the access's physical address, not its guest physical address. Oh, what? Depends on the access's physical address, not the guest phys? Ordinary memory by software. Huh. Um. Blah blah blah. If you create emulation, okay. If you create VM exits. It's trap like it occurs after the completion of the operation containing the right access. For example, the CS rip 
is references in the next instruction. Basic exit reason is a pick right. The exit qualification is the page offset of the right. I have that. Okay, yeah, so you have no you have no idea. What you have to you actually have to disassemble the instruction to figure out what's being written to the APIC. You have to decode. Fuck that. God, that's annoying because it has that information. With X2 APIC, that would be a lot easier because <laughs> it's an MSR. Um... X2 AP, yeah, is much better in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, X2 AP is so much better for that. But I have to convince Windows to use the X2 AP. I think if it's present, Windows will just use it, but not necessarily older versions of Windows. So, to be honest, I don't think this is actually part of what I care about, so I'm not too worried about this. I've gotten to kind of where I want to get today. Um... What's this perf looking like? I gotta sleep. <laughs> I gotta sleep in there. Woof! It's like, man, that perf is ass. Yeah, about 4,000 resets a second. That's pretty fucking good. Um... For a quad core? For a quad core, that's fucking incredible. I don't know how much work it's doing. I could maybe count the number of instructions. Cause see, my DDM config, it's just default. Actually, I just, uh, I just turn off the border. That's all I do. I just turn off the one pixel border. And that's it. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything I can do here to improve perf. <laughs> Pretty much set. Pretty much set here. So. That's looking good. We're going to need to make uh, read-write virtual stuff, but I'll probably do that tomorrow. So I'm going to head off. It's been a long stream. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you had fun. Hope you learned a lot. Hope you didn't cringe too long when uh, when we were trying to figure out what the fuck to do. <laughs> See you around. Cheers.